Hello everyone, my name is Ryan Kenny from the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. I'll help be moderating the session. Uh, I can see people are still funneling in, however, I think it's in our best prudence to get this started as we'll actually start this all off with a 30 minute video prior to the uh, question asking session at the very end. Uh, if you have any questions, do please hold them until after or you can ask them during. We just won't answer them until the video is done. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, like I said, be sure to ask questions if you have them. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ryan Kenny, the Creative Director for the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. It's my pleasure to introduce Maria Prevesk and Jim Riedel of First National Bank, who are joining us to discuss tips for starting and growing your savings, as well as what you need to know if you're ready to buy a home. Please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm very happy to be here today. My name is Maria Prevesk and I am the market manager for the Cleveland region. I support 14 branches uh, in the Cleveland suburbs and I've been with f and now for about seven and a half years and in banking, believe it or not, a little over 20 years. So very happy to be here today. Hi, I'm Jim Riedel. I'm the regional sales manager for the mortgage division at First National Bank. I'm about uh, 31 years into mortgage lending. Uh, my entire career in banking has been in mortgages, and I wanna thank the uh, YMCA for hosting us today. Throughout this session, Maria and Jim will provide sound advice on where to go seek reliable information, best practices, and what potential challenges may arise as you begin to save and pursue your financial goals. I encourage you to ask questions related to our discussion after it concludes. Thank you. We all know that saving money is important, it can enable us to be prepared for emergencies or to achieve goals such as funding a child's education or buying a dream car or home. But saving can also be daunting, especially if you are just getting started or if your paycheck is already stretched pretty tight. How do you know when you are ready? That's a great question. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of folks out at are wondering, you know, when do I start saving? And a lot of individuals decide, you know what, I don't. I don't have enough to put away. I, I already am living paycheck to paycheck. It's very difficult for me uh, to put money aside and I just, I just can't do it right now. And the main focus that we really need to think about here is it's not the amount, yeah. right, Jim? It's, uh, it's really just getting into the habit of making sure that you take yourself and pay yourself first and make sure that you're putting a little bit aside each each paycheck and kind of out of sight out of mind and uh, doing that uh, will help and go a long way even if it's ten dollars a paycheck or 20 and then you can increase as as your life changes and as you make more right i know it was hard for me to put money aside but until i started doing it and making a habit of it uh, it was it, it was very surprising to see how quickly that those funds add up when uh, they're not accessible to use so and how do you know how much to put aside? <laughs> that's a that's a tough question because, you know, just as I mentioned, looking at the amount that you need to put away every month uh, can be different for everybody. It is different for everybody, right? Uh, I think the traditional guidance is about six months of your earnings uh, put aside in savings in, in order to cover you for emergencies, unexpected expenses that might come up. Maybe your car needs fixing. Maybe something comes up. Um, that you're not planning for, right? Or something might happen at work with your um, job or maybe hours are lost and making sure that you have a little bit of a nest egg to, to cover those expenses for you is, is super important. I know it is in, in the mortgage, uh, on the mortgage side and, and when you're looking to, to purchase a home also. Mm -hmm. um, really, if you look at the statistics, it's overwhelming. Only 28% of families out there have a, a nest egg and a savings account. And uh, if we look at, the overall families across the country, about a third of them only have a thousand dollars in savings. And uh, when you think of those numbers, uh, it's not necessarily as much sometimes what someone is putting away, they just never started. And that's the piece that's super important is, is making sure that you start putting some funds away to cover whatever you might need. And I like what you said about getting in the habit of doing that because it is a habit like anything else. It is. To, it's like strengthening yeah. a muscle, right? right. You got to start exactly. somewhere. And yeah. even if that somewhere is a smaller amount, it, yeah. you can always build upon that. Another great thing to always remember, and I know this was the hardest for me, was I'm like, well, I want to make sure I put $50 a paycheck mm -hmm. away, right? Yeah. I knew that that was going to be tough for me. So set a goal that's manageable, something you know you can achieve so that you don't give up when you can't make that that particular amount right. each, each check or each month, however you do it. So 
Absolutely. But starting is the hard part. What tips do you have for someone who's trying to get started? Uh, aside from starting, that's the starting point, right? Um, really evaluating your needs versus your wants. This is something that's that's been really tough uh, for a lot of folks uh, that we see that we help on a daily basis, uh, my kids being one of them, right? Um, taking a look at really what you need versus what you want and do I have enough money um, set aside for that extra purchase or that Amazon purchase or that Starbucks, right? Uh, that's definitely a need of mine. I know the amount of money that I I spend on Starbucks alone uh, on a monthly basis until I wrote it down. It was surprising to know how much money goes out and, and things that we just want to spend money on. Um, so taking a look at budgeting and making sure that you're putting it down um, and, and planning and writing it on paper and looking at what you have coming in for your income and what expenses are going out and taking a look and saying you know what I know that I can cover this month for my, this much for my bills each month you know what, this is how much I can afford to put away each month. So uh, I think it, it takes a little bit of planning yeah. across the board, right? Budgeting is so important. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because that's the biggest piece to all this, right? Is, is writing it down, seeing it on paper and yeah. knowing what you're spending your money on. Yeah, and, and uh, paying yourself first. Yes. That should be yeah. one of your expenses. And a lot of times we don't think about that, right? We think about our regular bills, our right. utilities, and our credit cards, or anything, car payments, car payments yeah. house, mortgage, yeah. rent, whatever it may be. And, and we don't think about paying ourselves first. Yeah. So making sure that you create that budget uh, and make it manageable, that's that's the key to, to setting some money aside for, for what you may need. That is very helpful. And you know, we discussed building a financial toolkit in our last session, including finding the right checking account. How would someone go about picking a savings account? Savings accounts, no matter what financial institution you bank with, and I know with FMB, we have a lot of different savings accounts. Uh, we have our traditional savings accounts, uh, CDs, money markets, retirement accounts. That's another big one uh, that we don't talk about a lot. And health savings account, um, also known as HSAs. Uh, we, we don't realize the power of some of the savings vehicles that are out there. And taking a look at a health savings account and retirement accounts, if you start early and you take a look at some of the different uh, I guess want to say benefits um, mm -hmm. that they have. Uh, there's an array of products across all banks. Uh, with FNB, we have some great tools online that um, help us decide. You know, not only checking accounts but savings accounts also uh, to help you uh, decide what account is appropriate for you. And we have a couple of tools. Uh, one is the FNB Goal Advisor on our website, along with the Solution Center, uh, which you can find at every branch and online. And what it does is, if you're not quite sure what account's best for you, you can go in and uh, take advantage of these online uh, tools, and it'll ask you questions that you can go through, and uh, which will ask you pertaining yeah. to your own finances and, and help you better understand what questions you should be asking yourself before you start any savings accounts or, uh, I don't know, Jim, if you have it's, anything to add to it's that. beginning but the process, right? That's, that's it. beginning the process and getting that um, first budget um, on paper right. in, in real life and right. then you can see it and then start working towards your goals. Yeah, and the great thing about uh, some of the tools that I know just, you know, being selfish and talking about F&B in general, the Help Me Decide tool on our website, uh, we have some other resources that really walk you through step by step, asking you what your financial situation is and where you want to be and, and what goals you want to achieve and uh, and, and having those resources, FMB is not the only one who has resources like that. There's a, an array of products and services and, and available options for you to, to do your research and make sure that you're uh, putting yourself into an account that most fits your needs. As someone gets further into their financial life, are there other products they should look into to complete their financial toolkit? Yes, you know, oftentimes insurance is overlooked, and I know um, my husband and I, from a, from the very beginning, uh, thought let's make sure that we have something that we can afford uh, to pay every single month that can help us in the event that something were to happen um, with our income. We wanted to make sure our family was going to be taken care of and really make sure that um, our house and all of the necessities that we had would be covered in the event that something would happen to us. And I think, uh, Jim, you know, it's also a great vehicle for, for investment, investing. Absolutely, yeah. People don't realize that insurance can also be an investment vehicle. So when you do sit down with your insurance agent, I mean, talk to them about that 
as well because uh, insurance can be a good place to, uh, to put money away as well. And you know what? Everyone has different needs and different coverages. So uh, definitely recommend talking to an insurance professional outside of your banker as well. One of the biggest challenges to saving has to be balancing it with everything a family has to pay for, and especially with debt, which is such a big part of financial life. How can someone continue to save when they also have to manage loans or credit debt? That's a really good question. Uh, easier said than done. Just don't accumulate debt, right? Uh, we Something I tell my kids all the time, uh, and it is easier said than done. Uh, there is some good debt. Um, you know, a mortgage and mm -hmm. uh, a car and some debts that are going to help you build your credit. But there are some other mm -hmm. debts out there, credit cards and loans and things that can build up pretty quickly. You know, you don't realize sometimes yeah. when you're swiping yeah. that credit card how quickly those balances can yeah. add up, right? Right. And the interest on those are atrocious. Oh, times. it's so, and, and that's yeah. the biggest key with with accumulating that type of debt, okay. whether it's credit cards or or loans, you look at the interest rate and, and you receive your statement every month and you think to yourself, okay, I, uh, I'm the majority of my payment that I'm able to afford is yep. going mainly to, to interest. So taking a look at debt overall, if you feel that you're struggling and you're getting a little bit over um, your comfort zone, I always um, have, have been very positive in the sense that you can minimize that debt pretty quickly and uh, looking at maybe your lower balances first. You know, if you have a credit card with a couple hundred dollars on it, pay it off, try to get rid of it, right? And then if you have some of those uh, balances, like Jim mentioned yeah. about interest rates, they are pretty atrocious mm -hmm. sometimes, they're really, really high. And taking a look at how you can manage and start with the ones that have the highest interest rate first and then go down from there, it'll help you clean that up a lot quicker. And again, it goes back to your wants versus your needs, yeah. right? Uh, it's, it's very easy to accumulate debt and, and uh, sometimes we don't realize that it becomes then outside of our comfort zone to make that payment every yeah. month. Uh, so. And then the other big one is student loan debt that we're just seeing just grow exponentially right now. And, you know, the cost of higher education, as we know, has gone up. I have three kids in college. I know you have I kids have in two, college. yes. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's not easy um, doing this and, and, you know, making those uh, sacrifices so that you can, uh, you know, get through school. But we are seeing people coming out with, you know, six figures worth of, worth of debt after, after graduating, and that's hard. That's hard to overcome. It is. Any conversation about saving has to include the big milestones that families do dream about, such as buying a home, paying for education, and retirement. What should someone do to begin preparing for that big of an expense? Those are big expenses, yes. Uh, I know that Jim's gonna cover home buying, so I'll skip that for now. Uh, but if you, let's start with education. You, you segued into that perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, education, the, the, the average cost um, of tuition in private colleges right. right now, I just read a few days ago, uh, average cost of tuition is $35,000 uh, a year. And you look at a, a state school, private or uh, public, and we're right around, what, 10,000 or so. Yeah. Um, so taking that into account, uh, the earlier you start yeah. saving for that, uh, th the more your savings has time to build mm -hmm. over time, right? Um, and, Again, it goes back to starting and starting that habit of putting some some funds aside for that. Um, you know, next is retirement. That's yeah. another big one. Um, when you look at the the averages, I think the U.S. Department of Labor forecasts that about seventy percent of your pre retirement yeah. income is what you're going to need in retirement mm -hmm. at some points up to 90 yes. percent right depending yeah, on yeah, your what, on your method of living yeah, so what um, are, and yeah. being able to continue that method of living yeah. in retirement so alongside education and retirement starting early and making sure that you're building that into paying yourself first um, aside from just savings for emergencies yeah. but for those large expenses now if you're like I am where you have those expenses for college coming up quickly mm -hmm. and right now and that bill is there, yeah. uh, there are other resources available um, where you can look into some financial aid in addition to grants and scholarships uh, that are free money that not everybody's always aware of, uh, mm -hmm. a great resource. Um, and, and taking a look at some student loan opportunities out there, uh, they are cost effective and uh, sometimes you might not have all of it uh, put aside and saved, but if you don't, there's other ways that you can 
mm-hmm. help supplement that. Mm-hmm. Another perfect. great point for retirement savings is if you have uh, the ability to invest in your 401k at work. Um, you know, it's great because that's another resource where out of sight, out of mind, right? That money is coming out of your account or out of your paycheck, yeah. so to speak, um, and you're not really missing it, right? And it's pre-tax. It's pre-tax. Which is and the best part of it. That is yeah. the best part. And yeah. if your employer offers a match, mm-hmm. um, I know that many employers offer four or five, six percent matches. Right. Definitely take advantage of that. That's another free yes. way yeah. of earning a little bit more. And um, over time, that money is able to compound where you're earning interest, right. and, and then those that interest is reinvested and you know to make it i always told my kids if you are able to put a hundred dollars aside and you earn ten dollars in interest Mm -hmm. guess what that following year you're earning interest on 110 dollars no longer 100 and and as that goes on uh with time it's it's powerful the the compounding benefit and the ability to take advantage of as many resources as you can uh, to put that money aside tax-free is uh and to your earlier point the earlier you start Mm -hmm. The, better the more is. the yeah. more you have time uh, to to compound and earn mm-hmm. more and more so yeah. it's it's a little bit harder to do if you wait too long to start correct thank you so much maria is there anything else that you want to share you know uh, to wrap up the savings piece uh, everybody can save it doesn't matter the amount you start with it doesn't matter um, how often it's just everybody has that ability and, and building yourself that habit and starting somewhere is something, yeah. right? And um, it, as you move into different life cycles and different phases of your um, working career and your income changes, making sure that you take the time to, to budget and to write down everything and put it on paper. You'll be surprised um, some different things that you can do to, to really plan and uh, make adjustments mm-hmm. as years go on. Uh, if you're able to give a little bit more uh, for your savings or for that 401k contribution um, or for your college you know, uh, savings plan, uh, as time evolves, revisit it. And I know one thing my kids don't like very much is I, uh, I involve them yeah. in the budgeting and I involve them involved. in those discussions yeah. about wants versus needs yeah. to try to build upon those habits early on. And I think even I have two in college and one uh, son that's eight and, and he's, he's even in <laughs> understanding, you know, the benefits of, of starting early and making sure that you plan. And that's the key to this is, is take the time to plan as a family and um, it's never too early or, or too late to start. Hey Jim, there are not many financial goals bigger than that of home ownership. In fact, I'm sure it can feel out of reach for many. What is your advice for someone who wants to buy a home? And what are the first things that they should do? So buying a home is a big deal and it is um, not as daunting as it may first appear. So Maria made several great points about savings and that is one of the first things that you should be working on is where is the money going to come from? You know, and, and then the biggest question we get is how much money do I need? How much money do I need for a down payment and closing costs and all of the fees that are associated with that? So my best advice is to get educated early and often. Talk to as many people as you possibly can. Um, it's important to know, first of all, what your financial goals are, what you can afford. So you can sit down with a mortgage professional. Um, F&B, we do it for free. You come in, you can sit down, you can go over your debt to income ratios, which is how much you can afford on your housing and your other debts that you may have. And then I would encourage you to get pre-qualified, which is just getting an idea that, yes, I can, I can afford this amount as opposed to pre-approved, which is actually going through the mortgage process and having your credit pulled and your loan underwritten so that you know um, when you're house hunting exactly what you can buy and or afford. The um, really important thing, though, is, you know, know where you want to buy, know what you want to buy before you go out and start looking. So meeting with a real estate professional is also important. If you know a realtor, great. If not, ask your mortgage lender or whoever you're going to for your financial advice. If they know somebody, getting a referral in that sense is a great idea. Making sure you're targeted um, in the right dollar amount and the right area is is critical up front. What does it mean to be pre-qualified or pre-approved? Yeah, a pre-qualified loan is just when you sit down with your mortgage professional, you're going over the, the hard numbers. This is how much I make. This is how much I pay out in bills every month. 
and then you determine from that how much house you can afford. It's not good on paper, meaning a pre-qualification doesn't mean that you're approved for a mortgage yet. Going through the pre-approval stage, although it's not a final approval, will at least let you have a peek at your credit and know where you sit um, financially and how much you can afford. And then you actually get a letter from the bank saying that you're approved for X number of dollars as you go house hunting. Jim, how long does a pre-approval typically stand for? Yeah, is, and that's, is there that's a, a question, timeline? Yeah. We get that question a lot in, in, <laughs> we, we in the too. bank. <laughs> yeah, it's usually 90 days because your credit expires every 90 days. So when the pre-approval, days. we're okay. pulling the, the credit report, and those credit reports are only good for 90 days because your credit is um, constantly evolving and changing. You know, So if you open new accounts, close accounts, um, pay down things, okay. charge things. So we have to look every three months or so to uh, just get the next snapshot. Yeah, we get that question a lot. How yeah. long is this yes. gonna be? And nowadays houses are going so quickly, yes. but you know, not typically like that. And yeah. uh, it, it's it's rough because a lot of folks have that pre-approval right. ready to go and, and there's not enough houses <laughs> to, to get it. So that's good yeah. to know that it's 90 days. I didn't know that. Yeah. How much should someone plan to save for a down payment? So traditionally, 20% down was always the answer, right? Banks used to not lend to you unless you had at least 20% down payment. Now that's changed dramatically over the last 30, 40 years um, since I've been doing this. The um, true answer is as much as you can, as quickly as you can, there are a lot of programs out there that will let you get into housing with as little as 3% down or even 0% down if you qualify for the right programs. You know, having said that, you still need to have some savings, you need to show a pattern of savings, and you, need, you are going to need to pay closing costs as well. Okay. So there are you know, another three to $5,000, depending on the size of the loan that you're getting, in closing costs that you have to um, account for. Well. I know a lot of uh, clients that come in and, and just family and friends are always, oh, I can't afford to yeah. buy that house. Yeah. I don't have 20% down. Right. So knowing that there's opportunities out there for lesser yep. down payments is great. Uh, I think a lot of folks dismiss home yeah. buying and, yes. and and getting that mortgage because they feel like they can't do it. So it, that's great. It's unfortunate. We have a lot of people that are paying a lot of money in rent <laughs> that could be in a house and building equity in it. So right. is it true that some folks are paying higher rent than they would if they were to take out a mortgage? Absolutely true. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're paying eight, nine hundred dollars a month in a, in a rental situation, you could be paying six, seven hundred dollars a month and wow. own your house. So that's it's pretty, pretty amazing. It is. Yeah. It is. What types of mortgage options are there? So there are a myriad of mortgage products, and that's one of the reasons it's so important to sit down with somebody because you may be qualified for assistance programs um, that will help you with your down payment, with your closing costs. Um, First National Bank has a first-time home buyers program that we will give you $2,500 in grant just to, to help with down payment and closing costs if you qualify. Um, there are a lot of communities that cover um, down payments, closing costs. Lakewood, for instance, has the Lakewood um, program where if you live in the house for eight years, the grant that they give you towards down payment will be forgiven. Um, and a lot of communities have those. Ohio Housing Finance Agency has uh, community grants and uh, Heroes on the Block, which is police and nurses and firemen that uh, are, are eligible for, for grant programs there. Uh, FHA, uh, Federal Housing Authority, has uh, low down payments, 3.5% down. Um, VA is 100% financing, zero, zero down, the Veterans Administration. So if you're a qualified veteran, you can buy a house with nothing down. Um, so there are just a myriad of products and programs that you can go through. There's fixed rate programs, there's adjustable rate programs, and you know, I, I don't want to get too technical and too complicated <laughs> here because this isn't the place for it, but there, um, you know, this is why we're encouraging you to sit down with somebody and go over all these things that qualified professional that can tell you walk you through these things. I've been in banking for years, never had the mortgage uh, side. So uh, learning about all those different programs, uh, we, we definitely encourage at any time for anybody to come in, whether it's savings, mortgage, uh, come in and talk to somebody. We're, we're happy to help in any way we can. Absolutely. What are some of the common challenges you see that get in the way of home ownership? Oh, the number one challenge is credit. So credit is so important. And you know, Marie talks to her children about the savings and the, and the money. I talk to my kids about credit. I think it is so... I talk to mine about credit too. <laughs> I'm sure you do. I mean, I talk to mine about oh, the savings. Oh yeah, oh but, yeah. 
but all it, is, important. it is so critical. I mean, credit affects everything in your life, right? So the better your credit score, the better interest rate you'll get on a mortgage, the better terms you'll get on, on credit, on, on being able to buy things. And, and it is just affects everyday life. So what, um, what I would suggest doing is getting that pre-approval when you're ready, when you know you're, you're close to buying a house and you have the money saved and you've met with your mortgage professional, is sitting down and looking at your credit report, going over it with some competent professional and having them um, you know, diagnose what you could be doing better or what you've got. And really know what's in your credit, right? Yes. I think sometimes there could be well, errors. A lot of surprises. A lot of surprises. Yeah, That's the one thing you don't want is right to be right. surprised when you're yes. going to, to place that offer on the house right. and you need that mortgage yes. loan. And uh -huh. uh, it, it's it's a really hard thing. I know uh, going through my life, yeah. you know, things uh, as, as the more credit you use, how does yeah. that impact? Because I think... Yeah. Um, Let's just say you have $5,000 in available credit on a credit card. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using all of that, does that impact your credit? It does. That it will does. affect your score. The higher your balance is as opposed to your limit, okay. the lower your score will be. So if you have a $5,000 limit and you're using $4,900 of it as opposed to $2,900 of it, you will have a worse score. Never realize that that impacts your scoring. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing I think a lot, a lot. if any advice we can give in, in credit scores is yeah. it's not just the payments. Right. It's not just making on-time payments, it's how Although, much of it you're using also. Making those on-time payments, critical. So Very. that is that is the number one thing you'll get dinged for. Right. The other big things is we'll, we'll see a lot of collections on there that people aren't aware of. They may have had a cable bill from an apartment they rented Seven in college. years ago, in college, <laughs> whatever, and it was never satisfied. So they may have a hundred and twenty dollar little cable bill that's hanging out there, and that can severely impact um, what your credit score is. So getting that stuff cleaned up first, really, really important. Earlier, you raised a point about mortgage sometimes actually being less expensive than rent. That's very interesting. What are some other benefits of buying versus renting? I think the biggest benefit of home ownership, obviously, is the equity you're building up in your home. That means that as your home value rises and you're paying down your mortgage, you're building a savings account basically in your home. So the, the big benefit there is you're not paying somebody else's rent or mortgage for them. You are paying yourself every time you make your mortgage payment. And I think that's you know, a wonderful benefit. The, there's also tax implications on a mortgage. Um, there are tax benefits that you can write off. Um, so I would consult your CPA about those, um, but those can help um, you know, alleviate a lot of the taxes that you're paying. Anything else that you can think of, Marie? You know, that's the one thing uh, that a lot of my friends and family have said to me, you know, you're in banking, it's just easier to rent. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always gonna have a mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we give advice on someone that says, well, I'm always going to have a payment, so why not just rent, right? Mm -hmm. And building that equity is something I think a lot of folks don't don't recognize. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you go to sell that house somewhere down the getting road, you're going to be get, getting something back. Whereas if when you leave your apartment and, and you go it. off, that's it. Yeah. That's the, it. the landlord thanks you because you've helped him pay off his mortgage. <laughs> right. So that's In the, the end, you don't have right. an investment, anything to show for anything it. To show for so it. all that money is just being thrown away. Yeah. The news has been full of stories about the housing market and how fast houses are being sold. Is there anything a buyer can do to stay competitive? Well, number one is doing the research and being pre-approved before you go out house hunting. Talking to a real estate professional, being very targeted on what you want to buy. Um, if you're just out there kicking tires and, and you know testing the market a little bit, this is a tough market to do that in because, as you said, Houses are going extremely quickly right now, and there's multiple offers on houses, and people are paying more than asking on houses. So while we saw it really, really heat up earlier this spring and into the summer, um, as school has started and the fall um, season has come upon us, it's slowed appreciably. So we're now seeing a more normalized market where there's not as much competition, but by the same token, all these things still hold true. Know what you're doing before you go out there, talk to your real estate professional, get a mortgage pre-approval, and then go house hunting. Seems like a common theme, planning ahead, yes. <laughs> doing some research and right. making sure that we're prepared before we're jumping into anything. Right. So, And that's part of your financial it literacy sure and making sure that you're doing all it's the all right things. all coming together. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jim, so much. Anything else you want to share? 
um, I would just make sure that you are doing your research, you're talking to the appropriate people, and um, you know, if home ownership is right for you, you will be able to buy a house. With you, all the different programs you talked about today, yeah. I think uh, it opened my eyes. I, yeah. I never uh, had as much experience on the mortgage side of the business, but yeah. learning, you know, all I cared about was what my payment was gonna be and was I approved to get the house I wanted, yeah. right? Uh, knowing that there's so many programs available for everybody uh, is, is just great to hear, yeah. it's awesome. Maria, Jim, thank you so much for discussing these different financial education topics. Before we open it up to Q&A with the audience, is there anything else you would like to add? I don't, I don't know. I think the common theme is preparation, planning <laughs> yeah. ahead. It's never too late. Savings is for everybody. Correct. Owning uh, your own home and, right. and, and uh, getting a mortgage uh, is, is within reach. Yeah. I think that's... And, and you know, your, your points about starting sooner rather than later, yeah. that's so true all across the board. I Whether, wish I would have done it. Yeah. You know, I waited a little too long. It yeah. took me a little bit more time. So anything you could do to plan early on uh, yeah. has value all the way around. Absolutely. Thank you so much, both of you. We'll turn it over to the audience now. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, we're going to turn it over to our live Q&A with our, actually our CFO, Holly Duplain. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Holly Duplain. I'm the CFO for the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. Um, hope you enjoyed the Q&A session. Um, and we've got quite a bit of questions coming in to answer some live questions here at the end. So um, one of our first questions is, can you explain more about HSAs and what you can use them for, Maria? Yes, HSAs are a, a great savings vehicle for you to be able to accumulate some savings for qualified medical expenses. And the great thing about HSAs is that it is, um, it, you, you have the ability to put those funds into an account pre-tax dollars. Uh, so great tax advantages uh, there for you. And uh, as you accumulate savings, if you're not always using them year by year for those qualified medical expenses, they go year to year, which is great. And uh, eventually, once you turn 65, if you'd like to use those funds for something outside of qualified uh, medical expenses, you can do that. It is taxable as income, but uh, it's a great savings vehicle that a lot of folks don't think about uh, that can go alongside your 401k and retirement. Uh, it gives the power of compounding again. And if you don't use all the funds for the qualified uh, medical expenses, you can use it for other things later in life. So right. great. And health savings accounts also don't have to be set up by your employer, right? right. A lot of banks set them up for financial institutions. So. Absolutely, and the nice thing is a lot of employers will do uh, contributions to that as part of a benefits package, so you definitely want to look into that as well. Um, another way to get a little bit uh, more money for your uh, for your ability to, to take advantage of those benefits that are free. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, besides an HSA, are there other pre-tax savings I might consider that could lessen my financial burden? Absolutely. You know, outside of HSAs, 401ks, we talked about a little bit. Uh, also, pre-tax contributions could be made. IRAs, uh, great, great products out there for really everybody has their own needs. I would definitely recommend talking to a financial advisor, a tax accountant uh, to see what's best for you. Great. Great. Um, have another question here more around the mortgage. Uh, what type of information will I need to have ready when I go to apply for a mortgage, Jim? That's a great question, Holly. Thanks. <laughs> um, you're going to have to be prepared um, to answer a lot of questions when you apply for a mortgage. And um, we have an online portal at First National Bank that will assist you with this so that you can download all of your documentation as you apply for the loan online. So it's a, it's a great tool to use. Um, and will help you prepare for this. But the basics are we're going to need your income information. So if you're a W-2 employee, um, prepare to have two years of W-2s in hand. Uh, recent pay stub showing 30 days earnings. Uh, we'll need your financial information as far as bank statements for at least two months. We have to show where the money's coming from for the down payment and closing costs. And then uh, credit information. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we pull a credit report when we uh, check your, your mortgage history, at, um, I'm sorry, your, your credit history. Um, but if you have some things that are outside uh, a credit report 
or things that you're just curious about, um, have those prepared as well. Great. All about preparation, it is. right? It absolutely. Is. Yeah. Bring, everything bring you need. that stuff in early. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Another question, follow up to that from our audience. How do I know how much I can afford to spend on a house? Yes. <laughs> so it's that different. differs for everybody. Yes, it is. And that's exactly what I was going to say, Maria. Oh, it is yeah. different for everyone. Um, there's no, there's no, you know, right or wrong answer here. The, the, the ability to afford a home is going to be based on on three big things: your credit, your um, employment history, and your income. So, if you um, you know, know those numbers. If you can, you know, determine your income based on on gross monthly, and you know what your debts are that you pay monthly. There are mortgage calculators you can use that are online. Um, FNB is bringing one out very soon that will uh, ease you into this. But um, I would get with a mortgage professional, sit down, go over the numbers, and find out exactly what that number is before you go house hunting because there's so much. <laughs> So much it's misinformation, yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, having a pre-approved loan, I mean, we talked about this earlier, having a pre-approved loan in hand as you're shopping really, really strengthens your case when you're making an offer on the house. So I would highly recommend doing that. Yeah, and, and it goes back to, you know, even if, if we're not using online tools, just write it all down, right? Yes. Know what you can afford, know how much you're paying every month, yep. know how much you're looking to borrow, versus how much you have in a down payment. All those things just make such a big difference. And I, I know the first time I bought a house, I just, I wanted the house, right? right. I wanted that house. And <laughs> I remember mom and dad saying, you just got married and I don't think you can afford that house. So it's a it's a easy thing to, to have those wants and needs, but Absolutely. at the same time, planning ahead and knowing how much you can afford is super, super important. Yeah, Maria keeps bringing this back to the budget and writing it down. <laughs> yeah. and she's so right. Budgets I mean, are important. Yes. Please, if you remember anything, a budget is super important because it really, really sets you up for preparing for all those important things that you're going to go through in your life. That's absolutely right. Great, great. Uh, another question, I already own a home. What are some of the pros and cons of refinancing? That's, yeah, that's, I, that one. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're back to mortgages, so yeah. yeah. Um, it, this year, especially in the last two years, we've seen historically low interest rates. So um, the, you know, the, the, there's general rules of thumb, right? I have to save at least, you know, $1,000 or I have to, you know, have a 1% savings and my interest rate go from 4% to 3%. None of those really matter. It's so individualized. So you really want to, you know, again, meet with a mortgage professional, sit down and go over the numbers. If you can save sometimes $20 a month, it may make sense to lower your interest rate or shorten your term and actually make the same payment, right. but you will, with a shorter term, save thousands of dollars over the life of the mortgage. It really depends on the goal, right? If yep. your goal is to ultimately save overall interest, then shortening a term can certainly do that. Yeah. If your goal is to lower that monthly payment and you know you took that mortgage out five years ago when rates were in a different place than they are today, yeah. um, you can really open up that cash flow and take that extra 20 or $30 and apply it to your savings account because you're already used to making that payment anyways. So uh, taking advantage of low rates can help either uh, for a short term or a long term need, which is, which is very important. Yeah, and, and be aware of how much you're paying in closing costs for that refinance as well, because those are there, there can be hidden costs and fees um, when you're talking about financing a home, and you really want to make sure that you're getting the best deal possible so that you're not um, eating up what savings might occur by incurring a lot more cost um, just right. to do the refinance. Right. I think that's a great point. I know when I personally refinanced, you know, the question is how long are you going to stay in the, the home? And yeah. If you're going to stay in there a reasonable length of time versus a short time, uh, you're yeah. right. Are you eating away at some of right. your equity? Yeah. Um, so. And there's a break even point, right? So there's a, there's a point where you're going to, the amount of cost, you know, and, and your savings are going to break even Absolutely. and and maybe six or seven years. So if you're not going to be in that home for six or seven years, there's no reason to do the refinance right now. But if you know I'm in this for the next 30, right. then, you know, it may be, it may be a good shot to, to look, especially with and with that's something the they are. It's something the mortgage um, officer can help us with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Great. Maria, you mentioned CDs. What is a CD? Mm -hmm. <laughs> CD is a, is a great thing. Maybe not today uh, with the rate, interest rate environment uh, where we are, but typically um, a CD is another form of a savings account where you are um, 
contributing a, a certain amount. So let's just say you have five thousand dollars you want to put away, and you would typically earn a better interest rate in a savings in a CD than a savings account because you are in exchange for a higher rate of return going to keep those funds on deposit with the bank for a certain term. There's uh, CDs that are shorter term CDs and longer term CDs. So in the sense, if you are agreeing to say, you know what, I'm gonna keep these funds on deposit for five years, you're going to tend to earn a better interest rate and a better rate of return than if you kept it in for one year or six months. Uh, so typically what to know about a, a certificate of deposit is if, if you're going to need the funds, it's probably not the best product for you just because a CD, once you put those funds in for whatever term you decide, that money doesn't come back to you until that term is over because you're agreeing to keep those funds there. And the nice thing- What if you need to access the funds during that five year period if you did a five year term question. CD? Yeah, if something yeah. comes up for a CD and say you thought you can keep it away for five years, uh, you will potentially uh, forfeit some interest and uh, potentially earn a, or not earn, I should say, be penalized with a penalty. And those vary depending on where you are in the term, how much your CD is. So it's a great, great savings vehicle for someone who isn't quite comfortable putting their money in the market. Um, because you know what, you know, whatever your interest rate's going to be on that term, as you're guaranteeing those funds to the bank, the bank is also guaranteeing you that you're gonna earn whatever that interest rate is. So if you're putting it in for five years and you say, you know what, I know I'm going to earn two and a half percent, at the end of that term, you already know what you're gonna earn. So it's very predictable, but at the same time, it's uh, going to earn you a little bit more than an account that you can tap into and deposit to regularly, so. So yeah. once you set the CD amount, that amount can't change, you can't add to it? No, typically bank. not. Uh, mm -hmm. First National Bank does offer, and some other banks do offer some flexible CD options, mm -hmm. uh, but your standard uh, certificate of deposit, you're putting that in for whatever the term is and then getting those funds back at the end of the term. What's nice is at the end of the term, if rates are better, you can reinvest that into a new CD and it doesn't have to be the same term. You can pick something maybe you knew that you kept those funds in there for five years, but now you know you can keep it in only for two years because you have a big expense coming up or you saved for a roof or whatever it is yeah. that those funds are gonna be allocated to. Um, you know that you can, you control that, which is nice. And emergencies do come up. So if something happens and you have to break the term, just talk to your banker and uh, figure out what, what you can do to, to access it. Okay, great. Um, next question, is it better to pay off debt or is paying over time better to improve credit? So credit is a um, <laughs> moving target. Your credit report yeah. number changes every day. Um, it's based on balances. So if you have a credit card where you have a $5,000 limit and you have $4,900 charged on that credit card, that will worsen your score. So if you have a, a $900 balance on that $5,000 limit, that will improve your credit score by quite a bit. What people misunderstand is they think they should close all of their credit cards um, before they apply for a loan. And don't do that. Yes, please <laughs> don't, don't do, do that. that. <laughs> because credit history right. is really important on your credit report. They look at how long you've had um, these uh, cards open, how long you've had the credit for. So if you have a credit card that you've owned for 15 years and all of a sudden you close it, that's going to really hurt your score. Hurt your credit experience, You can right? pay it down to zero and keep it open. That will help you. But don't close them. Don't shut them down completely because the credit history is really, really important. So, yes, I mean, paying down your debts is obviously a good, good move anytime that you can do it. But you have to balance that against, you know, what am I going to put for my down payment if you're buying a house, for instance? And, um, you know, where's the best money allocated? Again, sitting down with somebody, you know, we've been over this. Um, oh, yeah. Please sit down with somebody and go over that before you make these financial decisions because they can be very impactful. If I can add one oh, thing please. to that, um, when you're looking at paying off debt, take a look, and we mentioned mm -hmm. it in uh, the, the questions a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. make sure you look at those higher rates uh, accounts first. So if you have credit cards and you have multiple credit cards, a lot of the department store cards, it, it sounds great to go and get a Target card or, or a credit card at a, at a department store. Those tend to have a little bit higher rates um, than the standard Visa, MasterCard. And uh, if you pay those down first, 
you're going, your money is going to work better for you that way and then start with those higher ones and go down. Uh, but definitely take a look at how much you're using because that was one thing I learned really quickly is I thought the more you used credit and just make the minimum payment that that was enough. Right. And it's and it's not um, it's it's a combination of multiple things. So definitely come in and either your own bank or, or First National. We're happy to help you plan uh, for it. For anything of and opening cards, I mean, we require three trade lines to get a mortgage. So you have to have three different credit, re, yeah, credit repositories okay. on on file before you qualify for a mortgage. So so opening the cards isn't bad, using them isn't bad, but paying right. them off every month is really important, and that's the hard part, right? Yeah, it's easy to charge it's the balance. Yeah, it's the balance. Yeah, so okay. we want to see usage, but we don't want to see balances. So okay. we would love if you you know charge your groceries, but then pay it off at the end of the month. So that really helps your credit. But right. if you if you charge them up and keep high balances, that's not going to help you. Okay. Great. Well, I think this concludes our last question. And again, I wanted to um, thank all our viewers today. Um, hope that you walked away with some great content to uh, some of the questions you may have about saving or your first mortgage or refinancing. And I'd like to, to thank our, our guests here, Maria Previs and Jim Riedel. Um, and uh, thank First National Bank for their sponsorship um, and presented by the YMCA of Greater Cleveland. Thank you. We were happy to be here. Thanks, Holly. Thanks. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. We will be having future series uh, available, and this will be on our YouTube page shortly. Thank you all for attending. We hope to see you soon.